Nice to be with everyone this evening. Here in Wisconsin, we've had a wet, misty day. Something about the water element, the cohesion, sort of like it or not, we're stuck together, <laughs> mostly indoors. Thought it would be a good night to talk about loving kindness practice. And in particular, this, uh, how wisdom and love work together can be understood together. And uh, a lot of the times you hear from Shelley and myself when we're giving instructions, just encouraging this open awareness practice, whatever's predominant, whatever the mind is knowing, to work with that as a teacher. That's just the next thing being known. And uh, I think that open awareness practice could sometimes at least be described as a letting it rip practice. You know, you just sort of let life happen, let experience, allow phenomena to come and go. And even though my mind might have a lot of habits of relating to experience with greed and lust or hate and aversion or denial and distraction, I'll notice the stress of that trying to control, trying to get rid of, trying to have. And so the let it rip style of practice really depends on the um, uncompromising teaching ability of dukkha, of suffering and stress, right? Because when we just let life happen, but we're inserting, we're inspiring ourselves to be aware then so much of what we experience in our heart as a response to what's being known is contraction, getting tight one way or another, and then awareness will know that. And generally the Buddha balances that style of practice, the general category of let it rip, just let stuff happen, don't, try to direct your attention to something, just practice being free with whatever's happening. And notice when the heart is unfree, is entangled and burdened by what's happening and learn from that. And the, but there's a whole other category, the other half of practice, which is where we borrow from our enlightened elders, the qualities of mind, the qualities of heart, the attitudes that we hear that they've developed. So instead of waiting for those good qualities, wholesome qualities to de develop naturally, organically on their own, we get this you know, report from somebody who seems to have a lot of ease and a lot of skill and a lot of freedom. And they say, you know what? Loving kindness and compassion, can't beat those attitudes. <laughs> and then, so then we're inspired. And uh, so instead of just letting it rip, we're getting interested just in the cause and effect kind of way. How does one grow kindness and compassion? What practically, pragmatically, supports the cultivation of kindness and compassion in our lives. So we've been chanting in the morning. Um, this is something we chant almost every morning sit at the center, come ground and often on retreats, this suffusion with the sublime abidings. And this is uh, useful, this word suffusion, pervading, imbuing, we have these words and it's, it's a way of like, we always have awareness. Often the awareness we have is colored by irritation and aversion and fear 
domination, wanting to control things, feeling some sense of lack, I want, I need to fill this void. But we, we can color the knowing mind, the sensitive heart with other colors. It doesn't have to be aversion and fear. It can be the color, the quality of compassion. And so that beginning of that chant, I will abide, I will abide pervading this quarter, what's right in front of me with kindness or compassion or whatever particular flavor of love you're bringing to mind. So it's, it's like we're cultivating in, in tension. And it isn't about like, the most special people are right in front of me. So, because ultimately it isn't about the object. It's really more of a confidence that we have that this heart is good, capable of being good, capable of loving and caring. That a loving and a caring that's not dependent on who's in front of me or who's in the second quarter or the third quarter, or the fourth quarter or above or below, which is sometimes a little different than how people learn the loving kindness practice where they really emphasize these categories, which is a fine, wonderful way to learn the practice for sure. But to remember that we're moving in a direction where the object of awareness isn't the person or the creature I love, like my cat or my partner or my good friend, the object of awareness is this attitude or this quality of love, kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity itself. I will abide pervading all quarters with this heart imbued with kindness above and below everywhere and every way I will abide. So it's like a, we want to hear this and feel this in our body as a, a powerful confidence move. Doesn't, I'm not saying that this heart is incapable of irritation and aversion and even hatred and, you know, fear and, any number of other less than wholesome attitudes. I'm just saying, I have great confidence. I have experienced that this heart is capable of a natural, generous love. That's not about any particular relationship. I might remember it when I'm remembering this person and I feel that generosity of the heart but when I really study, really feel into that quality of love, it actually isn't about that person. And that's really the, the work as a practitioner we have to do is to see that the love, metta, karuna, compassion, mudita, appreciative joy, upeka, equanimity, that they're not essentially about how we might find our way back to those beautiful attitudes, emotions. So I might find my way back by remembering somebody or remembering a situation, a memory where there was a lot of that boundless, beautiful, generous quality of love. And it really matters because here we're doing a, a Dharma attitude adjustment. So we have to find our way back. We have to arouse it. And then we want to keep it in mind. And keep it in mind. And there are any number of reasons to be irritable or to be upset. But that's not what we're trying to keep in mind. I mean, that's one way to meditate. <laughs> right? To sit here and to bring to mind all of the things that irritate us. I do that sometimes in my meditation. I don't know, I have, there's a deep 
groove, it, it may be partly the result of being conditioned as a male, a boy, um, when I was young, that it was sort of like, uh, I noticed that one place my mind will want to go is like imagining things where I have to do battle, you know? Oh, even sometimes when I'm up at Arrow River practicing, I used to practice there or often uh, a while back, 20 years ago or so. And it's a place uh, in the wilderness, just uh, across the Minnesota border into Canada on the way to Thunder Bay. So in the Arrowhead across the border. And then it's up the Arrow River, which is related to the Pigeon River, which makes the border between Canada and Minnesota. And they have wolves and, you know, it's a really, uh, they don't have a phone or anything. It's really out there. And, um, and I always think, because sometimes I arrive, it's sort of late. And if I'm there in the wintertime, you're sort of trudging out to the cabin in the snow. And I just think, okay, where's a good stick if the wolves come? And that image, it's sort of like there. It's like my mind wants to go to that noble fighting for my life kind of thing. I mean, it's just sort of funny what a groove that is, the warrior groove, you know. Um, but we want to find, like, whatever the well-greased grooves are in our mind, we have our romantic grooves, you know, falling in love or sex grooves or, you know, different sort of expressions of power and then not being good enough, shame grooves. I mean, these are like our top 10, right? I mean, there's probably others that, that I'm not mentioning. All of those, you know, basically not very helpful or wholesome, but we can create a meta groove so that the mind more naturally readily slides into a meta field, a resonant meta field that's not about the particulars, just like when for whatever reason, one of those unwholesome grooves has been activated, like being defensive or feeling not good enough. It doesn't matter the situation. I can feel not good enough in almost any situation. Even when I'm being praised, if that sort of pattern is activated in me, I, like that's not enough praise. Or you're just praising me because you feel sorry for me or something like that, right? So it's the same thing with metta or these wholesome attitudes, they have a kind of capacity to be self-reinforcing, just like our unwholesome patterns do, you know, because when we have an unwholesome pattern activated, it just translates all the data of the present moment to fit the narrative of the drama, whatever it is. But we can do that in a positive way too. Right, like we could be in the room looking around or those of you on Zoom, you could be scanning through the gallery view, checking out what people are wearing and critical of the people who don't have their cameras on or if you don't have your camera on, critical of the people who do have their cameras on, <laughs> show offs or whatever it might be. Or we could be sitting here together and cultivating strengthening a different attitude. Oh, there are other human beings. I mean, that alone can inspire a little tenderness. Actual living beings showing up together on a Friday night. How sweet is that? You know, and just when we see a body, it can trigger lust or revulsion, or it can trigger the sense, it's not easy having a body. You have a body, you have a body, I have a body. It isn't easy having a human body. They're very sensitive and they're like um, receptacles of all our stress. Have you noticed? <laughs> Not just like recent stress, just layer after layer gets laid down on the body. It's enough to break our heart wide open when we realize in a way the the physical body is the ultimate innocent victim of a mind that doesn't know how to be skillful, doesn't know how to be friendly and wise. And so because of the force of habit and the way that 
our mind, our heart's conditioned. You know, we don't relate very skillfully and the body receives that. So just every time we see a body, we can cultivate eyes, wise eyes that intuits, oh, it's not easy having a body. And we can kind of just sense how all of us were defended, we're tight, we're holding, we're, we've walled off parts of our body because we don't want to feel what's there to feel. And then there's just all the other aspects of the body, just the aging process and disease. So this simple uh, chant we do in the morning, I will abide pervading all quarters with love, all flavors of love above and below, all around everywhere and every way. It's a little different translation than the one we chant this morning, uh, in the morning. Um, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, boundless, because when we're aware of that attitude of love, and it isn't about a particular relationship, we can really notice that it isn't bounded. Like to whatever degree we can sense and keep in mind some tender heartedness, some love right now. You know, where, where can't it go? And you just look around. I mean, even inanimate objects like the rug in front of you or the computer or the neighbor that you can sense just with your imagination or the person you interacted with last week. Is there really, or are there really people that we feel definitively are not deserving of our love, our compassion, our forgiveness, our good wishes? I mean, it, it's clear that there are people that are hard for us to wish well, care about. But then even in those moments, if we feel that there's somebody who's um, we feel very threatened by, very fr frightened of. There can be metta there just for ourselves. We don't have to fall into hate or aversion. We can realize, I mean, it's the same thing if there were a dangerous animal, like a rattlesnake or whatever it might be, cougar, wolf, you know, it may initially be hard for us to wish well for that wolf. And it's not like we want to hug the dangerous animal or the dangerous person. Not aversion doesn't mean we're going to be best friends. Metta doesn't mean we're going to be best friends. It just means I have no reason to hate you. And I may be in a sense afraid of what you might do, but there's still no reason to hate you. I might hate you because of the habits, the force of habit in my mind. Now I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that we're there with every relationship in our lives, but to really reflect as, as a possible aspiration not to have to throw anybody out of our heart. Like, what would that be like? I put this article in our uh, Google Doc. So those of you who are here at Common, Ground, Common Grounds Retreat Center, um, you can get it maybe when you're home because you still have that Google Doc with all the resources. It's an article by Ajahn Sushito, one of the elders in our early Buddhist tradition here in the West and English. Buddhist monk um, was for a long time at uh, Chithurst, one of the monasteries in England, still there often, but now he travels quite a bit and teaches around the world. 
really powerful teacher. And the article is original openness. And I like this, even this phrase, because it, it's a nice way of understanding the coming together of wisdom and love, original, or you could say natural or inherent openness. It's a capacity, like I mentioned earlier, this confidence in the goodness of our heart. Like we want to make that a task. And you can't force it, we can't fake it, but we can practice. Do I have confidence in the goodness of my heart? What evidence do I have? We can look real time and we can also look sense through the past memories. When has there been a very real, organic, actual expression of goodness, kindness, tenderness? How about now? Where's that now? Where's that capacity now? And we know we're getting better at the practice when anytime we remember to look, we can find it. That's a good sign like that you've been doing this practice, this whole category of practice, loving kindness is just one part of this, but where we can find these wholesome qualities. Some of you have been listening to the Sunday morning talks I've been giving on the Parmes, these 10 beautiful qualities of generosity and moral sensitivity and truthfulness and energy that Shelley talked about last night and renunciation, resoluteness, equanimity, loving kindness, patience. Is that 10? That's close to 10. <laughs> And, uh, but like with these parmies too, we should be able to find them. Now, they're not always going to be in a really developed state when we go looking. Like we'll be really dead to the world and we'll look for energy, you know, and the predominant quality in the heart and mind will be dullness, sleepiness. But maybe there'll be a little bit of curiosity about the dull, how dull and sleepy the mind is just that little spark of interest. Now, instead of the huge wall of sleepiness and paying attention to that, what happens if we start to pay attention to that relatively small spark in the mind that's interested, like how overwhelming the sleepiness is? <laughs> I'm probably the most sleepy person in the universe right now. I mean, just that brightness of mind and keeping that in mind. So it'd be nice, you know, for these next few days and in the guided meditation tomorrow morning, we'll do some of, uh, I'll use some of the time to guide us um, in some loving kindness practice, which is arousing, creatively arousing the quality and authentic quality of love and then keeping it in mind and really noticing it's a central ingredient, which is a, an expansive upwelling. There is a movement and you could call it, it's good, I like calling it a generous movement of the heart, a generosity of the heart. That's how we know it's love because that giving, that upwelling, it's just like, uh, this is an image that's used. I mentioned this in one of the small groups today. Um, the, one of the similes the Buddha uses is a, a cold spring that enters a lake. And over time, the whole lake is suffused with the cool water from the spring, right? It doesn't sort of stay one place and all the old lake water is another place. And um, yeah, this, this way of keeping something in mind and that sort of the natural way to grow a wholesome quality of mind is to keep it in mind. Even if initially it's quite faint, hardly there at all, but we keep finding it, we keep finding it, we keep feeling it, we keep appreciating it. We're not forcing it to grow. We're just tending to it with awareness. 
And this is different. This is why I said this is sort of a different style of practice because in the let it rip category, pretty much we let what's predominant be the object of awareness. But when we're specifically cultivating these wholesome qualities like loving kindness, we're still practicing mindfulness, but we're choosing to keep something in mind, whether or not it's predominant. Because that's how we've learned to cultivate, to grow it. We keep it in mind. We keep it in mind. And this is really a beautiful setting, whether you're at home or here at the retreat center, you know, just to have a particular quality that for wholesome quality that for whatever reason you're interested in and just see if you can keep it in mind, not so much the concept, although the word is a useful bridge to the experience. So like a lot of us might use the word metta, kindness, tenderness, or whatever word you like, just as a way of um, supporting attention so that it can attend, notice, whatever kindness is like in this moment. Where is the capacity for kindness now? You know, it might be just in how your thumb is touching your thumb. You know, just a graceful and relaxed contact of one hand and the other. Maybe an expression of kindness, maybe sort of a bridge into what is truly that capacity. Because kindness and love it's that inclusive, it's really more about what's not there. It's the absence of hate, absence of aggression, absence of neglect. So anyway, I wanted to read a little bit from Ajahn Sushito's article, Original Openness, just because original openness is, I think, a creative way to talk about this blending of wisdom and love. He writes, openness then is a careful practice rather than an ideology that insists on openness to all people at all times. Misplaced faith in openness or trust that isn't backed up by a mindful assessment of what, you're, what you are putting your faith in is subject to being abused. Right? So it's not metta, love, original openness. It's not a stance. I'm all in for original openness. And then we try to imitate what we think that means. He writes, what is always skillful, however, is to be open to yourself about what's happening to you in the here and now and checking it out in your body and heart. Maybe there was a threat, but that's past. Maybe you've reached the edge of our capacity to be open and accepting of another. Then something has to be said to let them know that. Thus you replace a pathology with wise navigation. This wise openness naturally supports application energy. Just fancy way I think of saying, of showing up. He goes on. When there's that inner balance, we're naturally curious and empathetic empathic, I'm sorry, and we move into our environment in a positive way. But that's how you wake up. Life is most alive when you can be present at the edge of the unknown. And if there's one way in which the property of the deathless can be experienced right now, it's in the ability to be, li to be living free of the heart contraction of fear, depression, holding and holding on that comes with the loss of the known, which are all expressions of aversion. So what he's saying here, this is a ancient teaching in the Buddhist tradition. You want a, a taste of what, of the Buddha's liberation and of the elders in our tradition who woke up, had that awakening. The most close approximate approximation that us ordinary folks have for liberation is those times when our mind, our heart 
is quite established in loving kindness or compassion. Real, not, not sort of a imitation or fixed stance, but a natural, because in those moments, the mind is liberated, is not overcome by craving and fear. And if we had the wherewithal to be aware of those moments when love blossoms, we would feel quite free. So one of the reasons um, why the Brahma Viharas, these practices of cultivating that beautiful attitude of metta, loving kindness and compassion, appreciative joy and equanimity is it gives us confidence because we start to taste a temporary liberation of our heart. It's temporarily liberated from fear and from contracted states. And we feel that and it brings a lot of confidence. He writes, death, separation, uncertainty, they're all part of life. The Buddhist teaching is that we have the original potential to handle and in fact blossom in the face of these. Now that's pretty provocative, isn't it? I'll just reread that. Death, separation, uncertainty, they're all part of life. The Buddhist teaching is that we have the original potential to handle and in fact, blossom in the face of these. We don't have to feel threatened, anxious, needy, or inadequate. With wise openness, the main causes and condition for human misery cease. The gates to the good life are open. It's only because we place so much emphasis on trying to know what can't be known, such as the future and how other people are that we close them. But when all is uncertain, all is possible. In such a light, wise openness is the most obvious faculty to develop because the unknown is right here within and around us. I just want to, you know, take a little time and let's just reflect because it, it's interesting. We probably have more confidence and experience um, with natural states of kindness and compassion. And we just probably have better radar, even in terms of observing others, like when we're around somebody who's really being kind and loving in an uncontrived and unforced way, you know, we tend to notice that, don't we? Then we would with wisdom. Wisdom is a little bit more intellectual for us generally, not, not everyone, but, you know, we just feel a little bit more grounded and rooted in like what love is versus hate, as opposed to what wisdom is versus ignorance. Because, you know, for a lot of us, wisdom is always equated in having a lot of knowledge. So what is wisdom that's not about knowledge? So I think this, these descriptions I'm going to offer about loving kindness, metta, can really give us a new understanding of what wisdom is. So one thing that we you know, learn in our practices that metta, and I mentioned this already, is all-inclusive. And we talk about that, remember, Shelley talked about that a lot last night and in some of their instructions, remember the image of the mirror, wisdom, mindfulness, wise awareness, it doesn't care what's being known. It's just this is now being known. This is being felt. It's like this now. So wisdom has that inclusive. It's able to recognize 
meet, be intimate with whatever's showing up in the same way that love can. I remember reading way back when it came out, probably, I'm guessing the late 90s, Sharon Salzberg's book on loving kindness. It really, I think, has aged so well as a, a manual for this part of the practice, cultivating these qualities of love. And near the beginning of that book, uh, a quote that I've used a lot just in my own practice, she writes, Sharon writes, great fullness of being, which we experience as happiness can also be described as, as love. To be undivided and unfragmented, to be completely present is to love. To pay attention is to love. Now that's, that's a really pragmatic instruction, like when we're doing walking practice, and then we remember a little bit of that little instruction from Sharon, to pay attention is to love. Because how many times, you know, when we're being with the next in breath or the next out breath or the next step, and we were kind of there paying attention, but is it loving? <laughs> you know, is it, does it have that warmth and that, interest and that inclusivity. I really like how Ajahn Sumedho, another Western Buddhist monk in the Thai forest tradition writes about loving kindness. He writes, metta includes the totality of our world and experience. It includes every possibility, the born and the unborn, the created and the uncreated, those who are present, those who are absent, with metta, loving kindness, we contemplate all phenomena, all sentient beings in terms of loving kindness and inclusiveness, rather than in the divisive terms of which is best, which is worse, what we like, what we don't like. Metta then is a way we, we relate to the totality. Now, I'll give you an example of that. I mean, one of the reasons the leaders, um, Wynn and I, and some leaders fell in love with this place when we looked at it was just how, uh, just the tranquility of the land and the surrounding land. It's just really quiet. And uh, I don't know if you've seen, but there, um, I, when I went to get gasoline the other day for the rider mower, I saw one of the Amish families riding in their horse-drawn um, buggy or whatever they call it. And there's such a powerful example of living simply. Those families, about 11 Amish families in the area. This building was originally built by an Amish family. It was, they made Amish furniture here. And then uh, a couple other people owned it between the, the Amish family when we bought it eight years ago. So it's just interesting, you know, how when we look out, some of you have been outside, spending time outside, it it's, can be relatively easy to have a generous, inclusive, appreciative, kind attitude. But when we walk in the city, it's different. So it's, it's just interesting, is it, is it that the woods, or deserving of that tender heartedness, the fields, the birds, but the traffic, maybe there's trash on the street, maybe there's something broken, maybe there's this, maybe there's that in the city. Oh yeah. Because it's really interesting, like if we take up this practice, part of the power of the cultivating the attitude of love is we, see so clearly, precisely because we're interested in metta, we see so clearly all the ways the mind is in the habit of justifying irritation and aversion and hate. It's, it's amazing, even here. I'm sure you've noticed that there will be somebody on the retreat that bugs us, or there will be, you know, it could be just that their uh, shoes squeak. Uh, I think it was uh, 
Sandy, who was talking about her squeaky boots the other day, coming to the small group. And, uh, you know, some of us might think, oh, come on, don't, don't worry about your squeaky boots. But it happens that people get really irritated by these things. Corey, uh, who did most of the renovation here, our construction manager, and I were talking about needing to add more gravel to the driveway because it gets soggy when it's wet, especially in the springtime. And we were talking about different kinds of gravel. And I was telling them that people get so angry at retreat properties that have this particular kind of gravel and someone's doing walking practice. And each step, there's a very distinct And even like I, I spent months, probably close to maybe more than a year of my life at the Forest Refuge uh, practicing, which is in Massachusetts, uh, part of IMS for a long time retreat, retreatants. And uh, the windows on the north side, uh, there's a kind of an alley driveway that's gravel and people like to walk on that. And it's only, you know, it's not that far from the windows. And in the early years, when I did a lot of practice there, the trees weren't buffer buffering the sound much because they were really small. And so you'd be sitting meditating in your room and you'd hear every step. And then as soon as you reverse to something, it may be like in the great scheme of things, a relatively insignificant experience, that simple sound. But as soon as you become averse, the attention puts it front and center, doesn't it? And you're not noticing anything else. There may be beautiful sound of cardinals. There might be kind of a nice breeze coming in. You might have had a really calm sit, a lot of tranquility. But now you want to catch every sound. And then you're going to hate it. Then the next sound. And then you're going to hate it. And, uh, and it's like we really, the mind, not consciously, but just because of habit, it creates a hell realm. And it really is just a matter of what it pays to get, uh, pays attention to. So one of the qualities of, of loving kindness is this non-controlling, non-aggressive, receptive. I mean, imagine, it, because we're like this sometimes, you know, if we have a good friend that's sick or has cancer, you know, and we're averse, to their illness and we're averse to their suffering and we're averse to their insecurity, we would never say it, but we might feel, I really need you to get healthy because I can't stand the feeling of you being sick. It scares me, it bugs me, it's not okay. So I'm gonna do anything I can to make you healthy, but it's not because I love you, I just can't stand you being sick. <laughs> That's not love, right? We may help them or we may not with that attitude, but it's not love. Because love, like wisdom, there's something about love that's not conditioned. It's not about causes and conditions. In a way, it stands outside of that. That's why in that chant we do, and in all the Buddhist teachings on loving kindness, it's really about moving to this boundless radiation, this boundless radiance. Because it really, even with compassion, like part of compassion is I'm sensitive to your suffering. I'm really open and sensitive to your suffering, so open and sensitive. I feel my heart quivering, right? We, isn't that true? Like a I spoke with Wynn, um, Common Grounds, other co-founder and my partner uh, the other day. And she mentioned that uh, uh, she came home from work and there was a bird just sort of sitting um, on our deck, I think it was. And it just didn't move. And then eventually she kind of caught her attention. Eventually it just fell over and died. So she thinks maybe it had hit the window. But I don't know if for me and for a lot of us, this is a very tender experience and both on and off retreat where we're just sort of appreciating the birds and one hits the window and either dies instantly or spasms or is fine for seemingly fine for a while and then just dies. 
and we feel that kind of quivering, that love has a stability that, that really allows for the sensitivity. And that's the wisdom piece of it. And this isn't just with compassion, it's also true with joy and appreciative joy, where we're really seeing beauty, appreciating beauty. There's something that is still, that's peaceful, that's empty, but that peace and stillness and emptiness doesn't deny the sensitivity. Just like the sensitivity, the exposure, the intensity that, you know, of the quivering of the sensitive heart doesn't deny or isn't opposed to the stillness or the peace. That's why it's a real realization, what we're looking for, where we can have both the abundant joy of appreciation, the profound quivering of, a, of compassion, that there's something that's still peaceful and empty, empty of fear, empty of anything, um, anything unwholesome. That's what emptiness means. It doesn't mean we're not here. It just means we're realizing the heart that's empty of greed, hatred, and delusion. That's the insight. And you see, when we have, we've cultivated a bound, by keeping it in mind, we've cultivated a boundless, abundant, like that upwelling spring, you know, and then the, banks of the lake overflow, quality of love. It's, it's like love for its own sake. So in a way, we sense how it can be not about the individual. I know it sounds paradoxical because it's everybody and everything that's being loved and that the heart is intimate with and feeling but it doesn't have a fixed stance about how it should be or how it shouldn't be. I mean, isn't that, that's kind of what we think of when we think about saints. You know, they're people who have a positive, wholehearted approach to life, regardless of their circumstances. I was just reading something from um, Maha Gosananda. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's quite famous, especially in, um, Cambodia, he wrote once, if we cannot be happy in spite of our difficulties, what good is our spiritual practice? <laughs> it's kind of blunt. In his last years, he was very close to IMS in Massachusetts. And one three-month retreater I was on, the teachers who were teaching that retreat had gone to pay their respects to this uh, very old at that point. Um, this was probably like 2001. He died in 2007. And so maybe one of my last three month retreats at IMS. And uh, he was so impressed that there were sort of Westerners doing uh, Buddhist practice that he donated several big 50 pound bags of rice. He wanted to feed us during our three month retreat. That's very sweet. So he had a lot of that white rice during the retreat coming from his monastery, which is in like, I think Northampton um, in Western Massachusetts. But he was um, really a patron saint after the Khmer Rouge. You know, they killed like, I think it's 57,000 Buddhist monks. I mean, there were millions of lay people killed during that brief uh, realm of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia in the 70s. And uh, he tended to a lot of the refugees in the Thai camps right across the border. And then after the Khmer Rouge um, ended, that reign ended, he and others did these peace walks through the areas where there were still a lot of landmines, just sort of, just kind of with the uh, <clears throat> kind of a healing for the Cambodian people and became sort of the head monk of all the, of all of Buddhism in, in Cambodia for a while. So he was really inspiring person and clearly had to deal with a lot of difficulties. So the whole point is how does, how do these attitudes of love really 
temporarily at least, liberate the heart from the affliction that comes with being a human being, the fear, the sense of lack, the not wanting to connect, the not wanting to be present. This is from Ajahn Sumedho, Ajahn Sumedho again. Sometimes the thoughts and feelings in our mind are really stupid and useless. I reckon that the ability to sit with the rubbish is a sign of an advanced student. It takes a long time for people to just let the rubbish come up like that. Because we can even have meta like when really ridiculous and even despicable thoughts. Anybody have a despicable thought today? Yeah, I did. But to be able to see it with wisdom and love, oh yeah, that happens sometimes. I'm not afraid of my conditioning. What would that serve? You know, we were conditioned by ignorant culture, all of us. I don't, can't imagine any of you somehow <laughs> found a way to be raised in a enlightened culture. I don't know of any of those, right? So we're compromised from the beginning. And although our parents, some of our parents were good parents, still they weren't perfect parents. And some of us had good friends, but I didn't, and probably no one had perfect friends. And we have the legacy, all of us in our bodies, we have the legacy of pain and abuse, oppression, patriarchy, whiteness, right? It's all like here living just in our energetic physical systems culturally and individually it's a mess in other words and the outer world reflects that mess so when we come to a place like uh, here at the retreat center or in your home and doing our retreats together this is what's going to show up and we want to call like this this confidence call call on love a love that knows how to meet knows how to hold even the ridiculous the silly the despicable the confusing the beautiful the joyful i've always liked that you know how in Buddhism, when we talk about love, we talk about these four flavors of just that basic goodness or friendliness, metta. When that meets suffering, we call it compassion. When that basic goodness runs into things that are beautiful, we call it appreciative joy or mudita. And the kind of background or grounding of it all is upeka, equanimity, that balance that even when I don't know what the heck's up, I'm not afraid to be close. I'm not afraid to say, it's like this now. It feels like this now. I think Shelly was mentioning maybe last night about, you know, when it's foggy, when it's not clear, we can be intimate in a loving and wise way. It's really not clear now. The mind is really confused now. But there can be this very bright wisdom and this very warm love that understands, I don't have a clue now. You know, like holding that, yeah, sometimes it's like that. We don't have a clue. Okay, I care about this too. I care that sometimes I don't really have a clue. I think, I don't know, maybe I'm going backwards, but it feels like in practice, you know, we kind of start our practice with a lot of idealistic notions. So we really aim the mind towards really deeper, refined states of stillness and peace. And then, I, I mean, this is a gross oversimplification, but then, and then, you know, hopefully we have some insight and some development, but then a lot of the practice is a reintegration with all of our conditioning and making peace with being a human being. And one way this is 
I think talked about in a beautiful way. It's like, we're not sort of humans, ignorant humans trying to be Buddhas or Buddhas trying to be ignorant human beings, imperfect human beings. I think uh, that's a rough paraphrase of something from one of John Wellwood's books. That we're, we're not trying to be Buddhas, we're trying to be human, conditioned humans. Because that's really the miracle that I can have a body that's conditioned like bodies are conditioned and I can have a personality conditioned the way that personalities are conditioned and that real love and wisdom, real ease and freedom can, can express itself, can manifest in this very broken, imperfect situation. That's a miracle. But we tend to like our miracles sort of like 007, you know, it's like whatever, whoever you think is sort of super competent and super cool. See, this is, this is a sign of my 1960s condition. I was born in the late 50s. So it's like, these things make an imprint, you know, cool in all conditions. But whatever we think, that's sort of this idea of perfection, this idea of yeah, transcendence, we're transcending being, um, you know, foolish, caught not knowing what to do. That it's a much more profound and beautiful freedom to be okay not knowing what to do, you know, to trip. I don't know if anybody noticed, well, I'm sure some of you noticed I was carrying out a big mousetrap trying to be quiet. <laughs> And then I dropped it right in the middle of the living room when a lot of you were eating, you know. But I tell you, one of the great signs of practice is I didn't, I didn't insult myself. I didn't feel bad. I mean, I felt a little bit bad that you had that. And then I thought, well, that's good practice. Can, you guys can work with whatever comes up when somebody drops something loud in the middle of a meal. It just gives us something to work with. And I don't waste my time hating myself or wishing I hadn't done it. And that, that feels like the right direction. I'll just end with a poem. Some of you have heard this before, I'm sure, but it's worth hearing again. It's a really simple one. from Prusha Gertler, finally on my way to yes. Finally on my way to yes, I bump into all the places where I said no to my life. All the untended wounds, the red and purple scars, the hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin, my bones, those coded messages that send me down the wrong street again and again where I find them, the old wounds, the old misdirections, and I lift them up one by one, close to my heart, and I say, holy, holy. So this is our practice these next days that we have left on our retreat, right in the middle. Yeah, just how many times we can say, holy, holy, as we realize we don't have to get tight, whatever it's going on, whatever we're experiencing, we don't have to get tight. We can say, holy, holy. So let's let go of the words, just sit for a few seconds. <clears throat> 